Welcome, brothers and sisters, to a profound exploration of our history and divine identity. Today, we embark on a journey rooted in the belief that America is the promised land for the true descendants of Israel. As we navigate through Scripture, we unveil the profound connections that affirm our heritage. In Genesis 15 verse 18, the Lord made a covenant with Abram, stating, Unto thy seed have I given this land, from the river of Egypt unto the great river, the river Euphrates. This covenant, often interpreted traditionally, holds a deeper significance for us. Could this promised land extend beyond the traditional understanding? Could America be the modern fulfillment of this ancient promise? Let's explore this notion further. The river of Egypt, mentioned in the covenant, could symbolize the Colorado River, which flows through the arid landscape akin to the desert regions of Egypt. Similarly, the great river Euphrates could be likened to the mighty Mississippi River with its vast expanse and significance in shaping the land. In Isaiah 11 verse 15, it is prophesied, And the Lord shall utterly destroy the tongue of the Egyptian sea, and with his mighty wind shall he shake his hand over the river, and shall smite it in the seven streams, and make men go over Drishit. This passage speaks of the great river Euphrates having seven streams. Interestingly, the Mississippi River, often referred to as the Great River, also has seven main distributaries or streams branching out from its main channel. Delving into the etymology of the word Mississippi, it's fascinating to note that it literally means Great River. This etymological connection aligns with the biblical reference to the Great River Euphrates. Building on these parallels, let's delve into the teachings of the Apostle Paul. In Galatians 3 verse 29, he declares, And if ye be Christ's, then are ye Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. Our connection to Abraham goes beyond physical lineage, it extends to our spiritual inheritance. As we examine our identity and heritage, let's reflect on the words of Isaiah. In Isaiah 42 verse 22, it laments, But this is a people robbed and spoiled, they are all of them snared in holes, and they are hid in prison houses, they are for a prey, and none delivereth for a spoil, and none saith, restore. Speaking of restoration, let's ponder the contemporary establishment of Israel. Contrary to the scripture's assertion that none shall say restore, modern-day Israel was, in fact, restored through the efforts of influential entities such as the Rockefellers, the Rothschilds, and the United Nations. In 1948, the State of Israel was officially founded, marking a significant event in history. The ongoing support for Israel is evident in the financial aid and assistance it receives. The United States, in particular, plays a crucial role in replenishing Israel with monetary aid. Through various methods including foreign aid programs, economic partnerships, and military assistance, substantial resources flow from America to Israel. This continuous support raises important questions about the interpretation of the scriptural prophecy and the contemporary realities surrounding the restoration of Israel. In America, this prophecy resonates with the stark disparity in the black prison population. According to a report by the Sentencing Project, a research and advocacy center, in 2021, black Americans were incarcerated at 5.0 times the rate of white Americans. The report also found that in some states, such as New Jersey, black Americans were up to 12.5 times more likely to be incarcerated than white Americans. In the pursuit of truth, let us acknowledge these realities and seek a deeper understanding of our divine connection. Stay with us as we navigate the scriptures that illuminate our path toward truth and self-discovery. In the French conquest of America, a revisionist perspective unfolds, challenging the conventional narrative surrounding the transatlantic slave trade. As we navigate the historical landscape, a peculiar sequence of events invites scrutiny into the legitimacy of the origins of enslaved individuals. In the early 16th century, the first recorded arrival of enslaved Africans in the Americas occurred, marking the beginning of what would be considered the transatlantic slave trade. However, as we delve deeper into the historical record, a curious twist emerges. In the 17th century, Indian slavery, the forced labor of indigenous peoples, was prevalent across the French colonies in the Americas. Yet, with the outlawing of Indian slavery in the late 17th century, a transformation takes place, a transformation that casts doubt on the narrative of the transatlantic slave trade. 
The Code Noir of 1685, a legal framework regulating slavery in French colonies, primarily focused on the treatment of African slaves. However, as Indian slavery became illegal, a remarkable shift occurred. The indigenous individuals once subjected to forced labor were now in legal limbo. It is within this legal vacuum that the possibility arises. Could these individuals, stripped of their status as slaves, have been reclassified as Africans to circumvent the changing laws? The mid-18th century witnesses a surge in the transatlantic slave trade, with estimates suggesting that over 500,000 African slaves were forcibly brought to French colonies during this period. Yet, as we scrutinize the logistics of this colossal enterprise, skepticism arises. The infamous Middle Passage, the arduous sea journey from Africa to the Americas, presents a logistical nightmare. Sailboats designed for cargo and crew, not the transportation of human lives, faced insurmountable challenges in carrying thousands of individuals across treacherous waters. Consider the complexities of such an undertaking, the need to provide sustenance for the enslaved during a voyage lasting several months, the cramped conditions, and the potential for high mortality rates. The numbers simply don't add up when we contemplate the practicalities of shipping such a vast number of people from Africa to the Americas. But what if there is an alternative interpretation, one rooted in historical events and biblical passages? In the book of Deuteronomy, chapter 28, verses 68, it is written, And the Lord shall bring thee into Egypt again with ships, by the way whereof I spake unto thee, thou shalt see it no more again. And there ye shall be sold unto your enemies for bondmen and bondwomen, and no man shall buy you. Could this passage, with its reference to being brought into Egypt with ships, be a metaphorical description of the transatlantic slave trade? And if so, how does this align with the historical events of Napoleon invading Egypt in 1798, ultimately leading to the United States acquiring the Louisiana Purchase in 1803? The timeline raises questions about the plausibility of a massive transatlantic slave trade during this period as geopolitical and historical events unfolded in ways that challenged the traditional narrative. In the French conquest of America, a revisionist perspective unfolds, challenging the conventional narrative surrounding the transatlantic slave trade. As we navigate the historical landscape, a peculiar sequence of events invites scrutiny into the legitimacy of the origins of enslaved individuals. In the early 16th century, the first recorded arrival of enslaved Africans in the Americas occurred, marking the beginning of what would be considered the transatlantic slave trade. However, as we delve deeper into the historical record, a curious twist emerges. In the 17th century, Indian slavery, the forced labor of indigenous peoples, was prevalent across the French colonies in the Americas. Yet, with the outlawing of Indian slavery in the late 17th century, a transformation takes place, a transformation that casts doubt on the narrative of the transatlantic slave trade. The Code Noir of 1685, a legal framework regulating slavery in French colonies, primarily focused on the treatment of African slaves. However, as Indian slavery became illegal, a remarkable shift occurred. The indigenous individuals once subjected to forced labor were now in legal limbo. It is within this legal vacuum that the possibility arises. Could these individuals, stripped of their status as slaves, have been reclassified as Africans to circumvent the changing laws? The mid-18th century witnesses a surge in the transatlantic slave trade, with estimates suggesting that over 500,000 African slaves were forcibly brought to French colonies during this period. Yet, as we scrutinize the logistics of this colossal enterprise, skepticism arises. The infamous Middle Passage, the arduous sea journey from Africa to the Americas, presents a logistical nightmare. Sailboats designed for cargo and crew, not the transportation of human lives, faced insurmountable challenges in carrying thousands of individuals across treacherous waters. Consider the complexities of such an undertaking, the need to provide sustenance for the enslaved during a voyage lasting several months, the cramped conditions, and the potential for high mortality rates. The numbers simply don't add up when we contemplate the practicalities of shipping such a vast number of people from Africa to the Americas. But what if there is an alternative interpretation, one rooted in historical events and biblical passages? 
In the book of Deuteronomy, chapter 28, verses 68, it is written, And the Lord shall bring thee into Egypt again with ships, by the way whereof I spake unto thee, thou shalt see it no more again. And there ye shall be sold unto your enemies for bondmen and bondwomen, and no man shall buy you. Could this passage, with its reference to being brought into Egypt with ships, be a metaphorical description of the transatlantic slave trade? And if so, how does this align with the historical events of Napoleon invading Egypt in 1798, ultimately leading to the United States acquiring the Louisiana Purchase in 1803? The timeline raises questions about the plausibility of a massive transatlantic slave trade during this period as geopolitical and historical events unfolded in ways that challenged the traditional narrative. Expanding our perspective, consider the notion that black people weren't brought from Africa on the transatlantic slave trade. Instead, after Indian slavery had been abolished, slave drivers, catchers, and owners decided to reclassify their captured indigenous individuals as Africans to circumvent the changing laws. This shift in classification has left the black population, the real indigenous people of the land, subjugated to the colonizers, a condition perpetuated by a lack of knowledge. As the Bible states in Hosea 4 verse 6, my people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. This lack of awareness, combined with the wickedness of the colonizers from the early days of colonization to the present, has played a role in shaping the narrative we've inherited. Additionally, it's crucial to recognize that Indians were indeed brought in by ships during this period, but not from Africa. Historical records point to the Bahamas and Jamaica as places where indigenous people were shipped from. Reclassified indigenous individuals labeled as Africans were transported from these Caribbean locations up the Mississippi into other parts of the country. This intricate web of historical events, intertwined with reclassified identities and geographical movements, adds a layer of complexity to our understanding of the French conquest of America. But what does all this mean? Where is it all heading? As we ponder these questions, let us turn to the wisdom found in the scriptures. In Ezekiel 36 verse 5, the Lord speaks of those who have divided up his land and sold his people, saying, Therefore thus saith the Lord God, Surely in the fire of my jealousy have I spoken against the residue of the heathen, and against all Idumea, which have appointed my land into their possession with the joy of all their heart, with despiteful minds, to cast it out for a prey. The colonizers of America, the present-day descendants, are the ones left holding the bag. The judgment pronounced is fitting for the nations that have divided up his land and sold his people. In Joel 3 verse 2, the Lord declares, I will also gather all nations and will bring them down into the valley of Jehoshaphat and will plead with them there for my people and for my heritage Israel, whom they have scattered among the nations and parted my land. Reflecting upon these scriptures, we see a retributive justice unfolding. In Isaiah 33 verse 1, a lamentation echoes, Woe to thee that spoilest, and thou wast not spoiled, and dealest treacherously, and they dealt not treacherously with thee. When thou shalt cease to spoil, thou shalt be spoiled, and when thou shalt make an end to deal treacherously, they shall deal treacherously with thee. The spoilers, those who have dealt treacherously with the heritage and people of the land, shall themselves face the consequences. In their quest to rewrite history and obscure the truth, they unknowingly walk towards the retribution foretold. The retributive justice is not only a divine decree, but a consequence of manipulating history to the point where understanding becomes elusive. As we stand at the crossroads of truth and deception, let us not forget the words of Hosea 4 verse 6, My people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. The intentional concealment of history, the subjugation of the true indigenous people, and the manipulation of narratives have led to a nation adrift, unaware of its roots. In the twilight of Revelation, let us seek not just knowledge, but a genuine understanding of our shared history. For only in acknowledging the past can we pave a path towards justice, reconciliation, and a future that honors the divine identity of all God's people. Closing, let Psalm 94 verse 15 resonate, but judgment shall return unto righteousness, and all the upright in heart shall follow it. May the pursuit of justice and righteousness guide us on a journey of healing and understanding. In a world inundated with false prophets and misguided interpretations, the importance of uncovering hidden truths has never been more crucial.
At Hidden History and Biblical Mystery, we strive to provide you with genuine insights into the Bible, devoid of conjecture and rooted in both the obscured history of our land and a true understanding of the Scriptures. While others collect millions for teachings lacking depth, we offer you a unique perspective grounded in knowledge and clarity. Our mission is to unveil the real interpretations of the Bible, offering you a pathway to genuine understanding. The fact that the biblical promised land is often overlooked as America is a testament to the false prophets and misguided interpretations that have spread like a disease through this world. Your support is vital in ensuring that our channel can continue to bring you these valuable insights. If anything we share resonates with you or adds value to your life, we invite you to be a part of this journey. Consider contributing to our mission by donating to our cash app at Dollar Freeway Larry. You can find the cash app handle in the comments and description. Who knows, with your support, we may even embark on ambitious endeavors like on-field archaeology within the Americas in the next five years. Your contribution becomes the cornerstone of this endeavor, helping us delve deeper into the hidden history of our land. In this call to action, we're reminded of a timeless truth found in Genesis 12 verse 3, King James Version, And I will bless them that bless thee, and curse him that curseth thee, and in thee shall all families of the earth be blessed. By supporting our channel and the revelations we bring forth, you align yourself with the blessings promised to those who honor the truth. Your donation is not merely a contribution, it's an investment in the pursuit of knowledge, understanding, and the unraveling of hidden histories. Join us in this transformative journey and let's collectively uncover the mysteries that have shaped our existence. 2. 1. Like. Comment. Share.